Meanwhile, Buffett was making that first million. But this was early in his career, and he was still finding his way. So it wasn't the Coca-Colas he was after. He'd looked to invest in obscure companies, using Moody's Manual. Moody's was a directory of financial data of thousands of companies, the kind of thing you can get with a click of a mouse these days. And the young Mr. Buffett would scrutinize it on the search for bargains. He was looking for undervalued companies, the ones when you looked at the total value of the shares, they were somehow worth less than the assets of the company. These were called cigar butts. Why? Because you could pick them up for almost nothing, but there was still a little bit of value left inside. So a lot of stocks are cheap for a reason, and often a value investor will figure out the reason because everybody else has gotten sick of a management raping and pillaging a company, overpaying themselves, deploying capital poorly, um, taking advantage of the shareholders with, with free stock or, or, or huge options awards. Um, or hiring their brother-in-law. So, so there are stocks that have been perennially undervalued because they're run by somebody who fits that profile. A, a novice value investor will come along and say, well, that looks awfully cheap. And Graham and Dodd didn't really place the quality of management as high as, as they might have. And so good managements add value. Good managements have lots of levers they can pull. They can buy back stock when it's undervalued. They can um, use the stock as currency when it's overvalued. Bad managements will think only about themselves first. And so those are early lessons, but, but profound lessons that, that I learned and um, learned them well. Third point is we always prefer stocks that are in the news because we have quick access to them and therefore can believe the story one way or another. This is not a good reason to buy a stock. Research has been done by two finance professors at the University of California. They found that as long as there are attention-grabbing events of any kind, whether positive or negative, investors are more likely to buy these stocks than sell them. The moral of this story is, buy stocks that nobody's ever heard of and that no analysts cover, not ones that are always in the news. As you can tell by this chart of research in motion, it's very difficult to decide when to buy it and when to sell it because the stock is moving every day based on whatever the recent news is. Don't let that cause you to make a mistake. Well, you mentioned that stock list of 19 names that you right. saw, and I'll give you an idea of you know, what they have in common. Um, first of all, they have phenomenal balance sheets. They, most of those companies, once again, have net cash in the balance sheets. And as a collection, uh, or as a, you know, those 19 names, um, on average, can get rid of their debt with 20% of one year's cash flow. They yield 3.6% on average, which is, what, 160 basis points higher than the 10-year treasury. Mm -hmm. And to give you a sense of how cheap you know, that is, if you just assume that those 19 names grew their dividends by the same rate over the next 10 years as they did over the last 10 years, and then you said, okay, well, how much would those stocks have to fall in order for me to get the same return on, the 10 year, on those 19 stocks as the 10-year treasury? Those stocks would have to fall 40% because the 10-year treasury yields 2%, and these stocks yield 3.6%. And some of them, like Johnson & Johnson that you mentioned, have been growing their dividends for the last 20 years at almost 14%. So as a collection, these stocks offer much better yield than you're going to find anywhere else in the world. These businesses are doing much better than most people anticipated because a large portion of their business is actually outside the United States. So although you know, the U.S. economy is only growing 2 to 3% at the most, these businesses are growing their revenues 6 and 7%, and they're growing their earnings higher than that. And they're doing that because a good bulk of the business is overseas, and the overseas markets are growing much faster. And, you know, I'd say that it's very easy to find, you know, companies that have grown the dividends consistently for 20 years, that are selling at 9 or 10 times earnings, with 7 or 8% free cash flow yields, with net cash on their balance sheets, that have the ability to grow their business, you know, the same way they've done and in many cases, even if you look at the past 10 years, which was a very difficult period, we've had mm -hmm. two of the worst recessions in history, and you know, a lot of these firms have done incredibly well over that time period. So it's, 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 it's not inappropriate to think they'll do equally as well <laughs> over the next 10 years. Um, so I just think people are spending so much time thinking about overall risk, about, corporate, about sovereign risk as opposed to company-specific risk, and they're making these asset allocation decisions that's a risk-on, risk-off trade that totally ignores company-specific valuations. And it's providing 
you know, opportunities in my view that are consistent with the early 19th. Well, people typically go to whatever has performed well, and about the only thing that's performed well recently are precious metals and gold in particular. And gold can be a wonderful investment as a, as a diversifier, but it is volatile as heck. Generally speaking, it only keeps up with inflation. And to get into their gold because it's doing real well right now, it's not the ticket. And I've made that mistake before, by the way, when I graduated college and thought I knew everything. You invested in gold. As well. I bought gold at $664 an ounce in 1979. That has not come close to keeping up to inflation. And I would argue it's the best investment I ever made because it taught me I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. Don't you just love headlines like this? It's great for selling newspapers, but it's terrible for getting people to get in a panic and wanting to sell. Remember, you don't lose money until you actually sell a stock. Rather than see this as a reason to panic, let's use this as an opportunity to buy good stocks at cheap prices so that if we do come out of this market turmoil or if we go into recession when we do come out and the economy strengthens again, you'll have more shares with greater dividend income and therefore a better opportunity to make big returns on the upside. The way to do that in this market is not to buy at the market. Do your homework first and get an idea of, of what you think is a really cheap price for an individual stock. And you do that by using limit orders. Limit orders are ba basically just an order in the market to buy a stock at a certain price. And what you want to do is make it really, really cheap price or a stupid price, such that if a stock's trading at $20 today and you put in a limit order at 10, it may sound unreasonable, but you never know what could happen if a gap trade occurs if we get capitulation in the market. This hasn't happened for six years, so here's where opportunity is striking, and we have to be able to strike while the iron is hot. For example, back in 2001, nobody wanted to own Carnival Cruise Lines because of the terrorist attacks for fear that somebody was going to sink a ship. The stock closed on the Dow Jones at $24, and when the market reopened again, we had a limit order in at $17 a share, much, much lower than what it had closed at previously. When the markets reopened, by 10.30 that morning, and for only 10 minutes, did the stock hit $17 for us to be filled. It finished the day at 18, finished the week at 19, and three months later was trading at $35. So here's a terrific opportunity uh, to take advantage of all of this uncertainty and all of this uh, panic that's in the market to start buying stocks at very cheap prices. There is a value approach to valuation, and this is really what distinguishes it more than anything else, starting to look at the balance sheet, which most people don't look at. Most people project earnings. What Buffett has added to this is a systematic way that's much more intelligent than the standard valuation approaches for looking at growth stocks. A good valuation approach will also clearly identify the critical information that you are uncertain about and that is going to focus your research effort. When you add bad information to good information, what do you get? You get bad information. It's not a good way to go about trying to pin down a value. So it's in the area of how you look for stocks, how you value stocks, how you focus your research and collect all the relevant information, and ultimately how you analyze and manage risk and construct a portfolio, that value investing is very different from almost all other current practice. And the evidence that it's successful is that if you look at, in every dimension, what investment strategies are successful, statistically, overwhelmingly they're the value strategies. And modern financial academics have established that beyond a reasonable doubt. You want to go to the part of the market where other investors are crazy. Either crazy on the optimistic side if you're a short seller or crazy on the pessimistic side if you're going to just be buying stocks. So you've got to look intelligently for those opportunities. You've got to ask where is the craziness today? We think too much in linear terms. It's very often that investors will go to their advisor and say, I want 10% a year. Unfortunately, 10% a year does not happen in reality. In the last 100 years, a 10% return has only occurred eight times in the last 100 years. It's more important for investors to take the scope of markets over time and pay attention to the fact that they may have a range of returns based on their asset mix. So for example, if you have 
invested in equities, you should have an expected return in any one year of plus or minus 20%. The fewer equities that you have, then of course the expected returns are going to be lower. Try and get away or avoid the idea of trying to make 6, 7, 8% every single year. It just doesn't happen. It's not reality. That, as, as Graham says, you want to focus on risk before you focus on return. Um, some of that comes from the worrying that, that George described in his introduction. Um, a lot of it is, is focused on multiple scenarios. What can go wrong? How much can you lose? You know, we don't think of risk in an academic sense of beta, which doesn't make any sense to us at all. Volatility is not risk. Volatility is volatility. Volatility creates opportunities and, and isn't necessarily a risk at all unless you absolutely needed to sell um, the day that the price was very low. Uh, rather, risk is the probability of losing and how much you can lose if you lose. Um, so we focus on risk before we focus on return. That's obviously very different from Wall Street, where they still, even after pressure, write a huge percentage of uh, research reports that are bullish, very few that are bearish. And even when they uh, do think about other scenarios, they tend to think they tend to oversimplify with single point estimates rather than a range of possible outcomes. Um, and, and in other words, inevitably are focused mostly on how much you can make and, and with a spur. Volatility actually is the friend of long-term investors. So it's what creates the 50 cent dollar bill. You know, we say that we're supposed to buy 50 cent dollar bills, but that doesn't happen in a market which is rational and steady and smooth. It's during volatility uh, periods like this that, that, um, that values open up and that's actually good for the investor. It's not very much fun for the money manager and the clients are often nervous, but um, it, is, it is actually, first of all, um, opportunistic. Secondly, our companies are helping us through this period of volatility because it opens up for them a chance to buy back stock. So uh, MasterCard's bought back a billion and a half dollars worth of stock at 200 and some dollars a share over the last uh, 18 months. It's, it's uh, since the start of this year, actually. That's good. They're able to retire stock at a low price because of the volatility that we're seeing. It also opens up opportunities for acquisitions. Berkshire's made a couple of big acquisitions taking advantage of this volatility. Transatlantic is just the most recent one. S.A.B. Miller's buying Foster's. Um, uh, uh, Nestle's buying the Chinese confectionery company, the Chinese beverage company. Our companies take advantage of the volatility. So, so, so right, so it's not so much that, that, that you we're talking about lessening the volatility, but you're saying that they are that the companies, the type of companies that you invest yeah. in, actually take advantage of, of the volatility. Absolutely. Yeah. And then for my investors, I, I try personally, at least with the investors who I work with, to have a relatively small amount of their equity capital. And I advise them before they talk to me to make sure that they've, they've provided for themselves in fixed incomes and, and other forms of investments, which today, unfortunately, are rather underwhelming because rates are so low in their savings accounts that they're inclined to put more into the market than they should. But investors should keep a dry reserve just for periods of volatility. Otherwise, they'll be shaken out at the wrong time. Business. I don't want a business that's easy for competitors. So I want a business with a moat around it. I want a very valuable castle in the middle. And then I want, a, I want, a, I, I, I want the duke who's in charge of that castle to be honest and hardworking and able. And then I want a big moat around the castle. And that moat can be various things. The moat in a business like our auto insurance business at GEICO is low cost. I mean, people have to buy auto insurance. So everybody's going to have an, one auto insurance policy. Per Investing would be practically foolproof if only it wasn't done by human beings. If all that mattered was getting a high return, the obvious course would be to keep things dull, follow proven prudent rules, and not let anything deter you from that course. But we humans are social animals. We don't do anything just for the money, and that's where things get sticky. Mayor Stopman is a professor of behavioral finance at Santa Clara University. His field blends economics and psychology, and he points out that one reason people invest is to express themselves. Men in particular like to be seen as competent at taking risks and having them pay off. We want to be like Jim Cramer or, God forbid, Gordon Gecko because they seem in control. Chairman of the Smart Investors Club. Problem is, especially if you don't invest for a living, there are always going to be smarter people than you and your club membership can be revoked at any time. We're also in it for the emotion. There's nothing like the rush you get from seeing a bet pay off. Problem is, that feeling is literally addictive and can lead you to take bigger and bigger risks. Eventually, that catches up to you. So, is being dull looking a little better? Alan Roth, whose column runs right here on CBS Money Watch, 
praises the virtues of a dull as dishwater approach to investing. Had you invested in moderate amounts in three basic index mutual funds and rebalanced your portfolio as you went, selling some of your winners and buying some of your losers every year, you would have emerged from the crisis with more money than you had going in. That's right, more money even in the crisis. What's going on? There's a panic. A panic uh, is when it, it, you get panic on the upside as you got in 1999. It kind of lasts longer. Greed is a longer lasting emotion and hope and stuff. But now you have a panic based on fear and it's painful. I mean, people can't sleep at night. They, they, uh, it, it results in, in a really uncomfortable feeling. I feel it myself. How can you not? I mean, yeah. you're getting like this. And so what happened? The thing is, I'm disciplined over the years to not sell into a panic, but people are selling into a panic. Panics, by definition, are self limiting because eventually the selling exhausts itself sooner rather than later. We are in a panic that is in the process of exhausting itself. I was hoping it would be today. It wasn't today. So, so do you two agree that this, this is, we're seeing panic, I mean, is this what's called capitulation? Oh, not, not, I, I have no idea, but I would say I'm sure my technique would work very, very, will work very, very well, but it won't if you try and pick a bottom. Okay, so, so don't a, try to pick a bottom. Uh, you, you, right. buy, you buy when values are good enough and that the companies sense. are safe because they're eminently credit worthy. And the third thing is they have prospects for double-digit growth. Is there a meaningful distinction to be drawn between making money out of investments and making money out of speculation? Well, it's always a bet, isn't it? It's always a gam gamble. No, it isn't a gamble. It, it, there is a real distinction. Uh, basically, it, 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 it's subjective. But an investment attitude, you look to the asset itself to produce the return. So if I buy a farm and I expect it to produce eighty dollars an acre for me in terms of its revenue from corn and soybeans and it cost me six hundred dollars i'm looking at the i'm looking at the return from the farm itself i'm not looking at the price of the farm every day or every week or every year on the other hand if i buy a stock and i hope it goes up next week to me that's pure spe times well David. royce has for forty years had a very disciplined approach to investing and uh... like tom i agree that uh, volatility is the friend of a disciplined approach it creates opportunities to add to positions that are high conviction. Uh, we have a very consistent strategy, which I think also mitigates the volatility. We're focused purely on high quality smaller companies, uh, and they tend to be dividend paying businesses, which is quite a bit of a cushion in a downturn. In terms of quality, we invest only in companies that have very strong balance sheets. Specifically, half of their balance sheet needs to be funded by shareholders' equity, so that's a very strong balance sheet. Uh, businesses that generate consistently high returns on invested capital, we use a 15% hurdle. So these tend to be self-funding businesses that take market share in tough times. The, the uh, dividend uh, picture is also quite encouraging. I think people don't always associate this with smaller companies, but 85% of the companies held in the Royce Global Value Fund are dividend payers. Uh, and dividends have actually, since, the, since 1930, dividends have accounted for about half of the return of the S&P 500. So dividends are a huge portion of the picture that I think a lot of people m miss. So we don't really change strategy in, in, this sort of a, uh, in this sort of a period. In fact, we were talking before about, you know, should we be at the office or shouldn't we? It's good to leave the office on a day like today when the markets are down you know, 5%. We stick to a strategy. We may add to some positions that are particularly high conviction. But so we're not changing anything, but really just, you know, sticking to our guns essentially. In a highly publicized way, is anybody that is long is an idiot. Anybody that's short is a genius. Anybody that didn't see it coming is an idiot. And Noriel Rabini and people like him are, 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 are astonishing geniuses. And the problem is, as I said earlier, nobody's really good at forecasting over time. That there are a lot of people that can call one, one recession or one bear market but inevitably, they get um, they, they they get hung up on over overstaying their welcome or looking for the same thing to happen more than once, and history doesn't exactly repeat. So our view is, it might recover and it might stay awful, but to be safe, to have that margin of safety in our investments, we want to assume that it's pretty darn bad, and we want to assume that for quite a while. I think that companies that are fundamentally conservative in their approach, you know. They have a good balance sheet. They're not using leverage. And oftentimes, if you find that the people who are running the company have skin in the game, and it's not that they were given it, they weren't given their stock and options, but their sweat equity, 
people behave a lot differently when it's their money. And if, you know, a lot of the big frauds have been people who wanted to go make a big killing and move on. If it's their dough, whether they're based in the U.S., Switzerland, or in the Far East, they behave differently. And I think that's right. Yeah, and that's a little bit like, I've got this rule, rule, you know, the first rule is don't lose, and the second rule is never forget the first rule. So it really isn't so much having a lot of brilliant decisions. It's just not really having some terrible ones. And, and, and frankly, I did learn from Ben Graham how to avoid ever having any disasters in investments. Uh, it, it wasn't that you were going to come up with the very smartest thing, but if you never have any, any significant losses, you know, some singles and doubles will produce a lot of runs before you get through. Who was Ben Graham? He, he was your primary mentor, model? He was a wonderful man, and he was my professor at Columbia. I read his book when I was 19 at the University of Nebraska, and I'd started investing when I was 11, and I started reading about it when I was like seven. So I'd gone through all, I read every book in the Omaha Public Library that there was on, by the time I was 12, on, on investing in the stock market. And I had a lot of fun, but I never really found out, I never got grounded in anything. And, and it, it was it was entertaining, but it wasn't going to be profitable. And then I read Graham's book, The Intelligent Investor, when I was at the University of Nebraska, and that just together. opened the whole thing up to me. Yeah, and I and I named my my oldest son is named Howard after my dad, Graham Buffett, and, and he was a marvelous man. Never expected anything from me in return. He just did all these things for younger people. You have just a couple of quick examples of the things that he did that you. Uh, We'll look back on it's one thing to read something, but quite another to see it in action. Well, he, but what he what he did was he got me thinking, not as a stock as something with a ticker symbol that wiggles around and that you know that you look at charts on or anything. He, he, he taught me to think about it as part of a business, and and that was vital. And he and he and he he taught me not to really pay any attention to stock market fluctuations except when they were working in my favor. So that not to get you know elated because something had gone up or depressed because it went down. So if I knew the facts on something and it went down, I bought more of it, you know, and, and uh, because I looked at it as a business. And then, so and then, he, then, he, then he taught that famous lesson about a margin of safety, that you don't drive a truck that weighs 9,900 pounds across a bridge that says limit 10,000 pounds because you can't be that sure about it. If you see something like that, you go down a little further down the road and you find one that says limit 20,000 pounds and that's the one you drive across. Avoid the noise. Stop listening to the headlines, stop reacting to the headlines, and start investing based on what your intentions or your goals are of companies that are not in the news or on the headlines, that are under the, the wire. Um, it's very important that people not react to the noise. Usually they'll get caught up in an investment where momentum investors and retail investors will be buying like crazy, just like the commodities today, for the fear that you have to avoid the last man standing. If you're the last man standing and can't get out of your position, you've only got an entailed loss uh, ultimately coming. We have the mindset of the person that's buying the whole business at the price you would realize by multiplying the price we're paying by share by the number of outstanding shares. And, and we want the price for the whole business so calculated to look very attractive. So we like buying individual shares at a price that's lower than we think a rational person would pay if he could buy the whole business. Business of evaluating businesses, and and you decide that you're going to bring the effort and intensity and uh, uh, and time involved to get that job done. Then I think that diversification is a terrible mistake, and to any degree. And I've got a dual answer to that. If you are not a professional investor, if your if your goal is not to manage money in such a way as to get a significantly better return than the world. Uh, then I believe in extreme diversification. I mean, if it, so, I believe 98 or 99 percent, maybe more than 99 percent of people who invest uh, should extensively diversify. But is there a better way to do it? If there's a better way to do it, I don't know it. <laughs> I have this. Uh, I have this line that I use now on a day like today. It's, it, I don't mean to sound glib. But not one of my companies cut their dividend today. <laughs> so, so mean, that's a positive, people, right? People look at people look at the market in, in uh, too too closely. That's the trouble, and people uh, people never stay around for the for the good gains, and, and it's hard. I, I I don't know. There's no formula. It's just just hard work. You want to own great companies, and 
try to buy them when during either either daily or weekly or monthly weakness and and uh, you hope you're not overpaying and um, you have to be willing to trim if they go way above what you think is fair value but of course the important thing to do is think about how you preserve that mode around you know the, the the essential parts of your business and, and that's what I tell our managers to do I, I, I don't I tell them you know that that if the moat widens every year good things will happen over time and and if it and I don't care what the earnings are in a quarter. If that moat has shrunk for some reason, you know, we're going to pay the price. Ben Graham wrote uh, uh, in his uh, in his uh, third edition of Security Analysis, which came out in 1951. You can get it at the library. And in there, on page 536, he discussed the difference between price and value. And on page 726, he says, special situations, and he discusses them. And I use that as an example. I talked up at Columbia once, Columbia University, and I told them about McDonald's. McDonald's had come down a lot. It was selling at $14 a share, you know, the restaurant chain. It was selling at, at about 14 And it then out from about 35 and, you know, there were always some problems with these chains that things can happen. So I took it and I said, well, I think it's selling at 14 now. And I used Graham's formula, and his formulas, I'll read it to you because I thought it was interesting. He says, let G be the expected gain in points in the event of success. Let L be the expected loss in points in the event of failure. And so let C be the expected chance of success expressed as a percentage. Let Y be the expected time of holding in years, and P be the current price of the security. This is an algebraic formula. And you can make your own judgment. The beauty about this particular one, you could use any figures you wanted to, but, you, but the idea was, what is the formula? And what you do is you use... Uh, the, you, uh, in this case, I said, I think McDonald's is worth 22, selling at 14. So you're going to make, if you buy it at 14 and it's selling it at, at, 20, at, at 22, you've made 8 points. And that, what is the chance of success? So I use that, and I said, it's 75% chance of success, it would go to 22. And then I... You multiply that times a hundred percent minus C, which is to be the expected chance of success expressed as a percentage, and it comes out at six hundred. That is seventy-five percent would be six hundred minus fifty, and then you divide that by fourteen. Multiply and the denominator was fourteen, and you'd say it'll take two years to work. So you ended up with a formula of 550 for the, oh, the, the um, numerator, 28, 14 times 2 is 2 years, is 28, and it comes out of 19.6% as a return per year. So you make a 19.6% on a return per year. The beauty of this thing was you make up your own minds. You take a stock, you, you estimate what you think it's worth, and then you multiply it out and use that formula. And if you get that ed ed edition, uh, the third edition of Graham, of, of, of uh, the security analysis, which came out in 1951. And the reason I mention this is because Ben was working on this book, and he turned to me and he said, Walter, I've got a lot of things in the appendix. You let me know if there's anything in there that I should put in. And I picked this particular a thing which I thought was interesting because you can make up your own mind what you think the company is worth and then see whether how long it would take to do it and it's just a judgment factor but it's a great experience because I I picked up a book when I was 19 I got interest in stocks when I was about six or seven and I bought my first stock when I was 11 but I was playing around with all this stuff and I had charts and volume and I'm making all kinds of technical the calculations and everything and then I picked up a little book and it just said that you're not buying some little ticker symbol that bounces around every day you're buying, you're buying a part of a business and 
as soon as I started thinking about it that way, everything else followed. Very simple. There's a chapter 8 in Ben Graham's Intelligent Investor about the attitude towards stock market fluctuations. And that and the chapter 20 on the margin of safety are the two most important essays ever, ever written on.